I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Lurkers, welcome to this week's episode. Before we get started with the meat of the episode, just a heads up that Lurk will soon have a Patreon account for anybody wanting to help with the cost of producing the podcast. For $5 a month, Lurk patrons will get a shout out during an episode, a sticker, and at least two bonus episodes a month. The funds generated will go to podcast hosting fees, website domain fees, upgrades to equipment, you know, like a chair that doesn't squeak, and hopefully the ability to travel to some more haunted locations to bring you more content. So look for that to launch sometime in April. Today we're going to be looking into the UFO sightings that happened in the area of Dexter, Michigan in March of 1966. Here's a little trivia for you. The Creedence Clearwater Revival 1969 song it came out of the sky, was based on this 1966 event in Michigan. And that's actually how I stumbled upon the topic. The main event takes place on March 20th, 1966, but we're going to start a few days before that. On March 14th, 1966, during a routine patrol by Car 19 of Washtenaw County Sheriff's Department, the UFO event began. The report went as follows. 3.50 a.m. received call from deputies Robert Bushrow and John Foster, stating that they saw some suspicious objects in the sky. Disc, starlight colors, red and green, moving very fast, making sharp turns, having left to right movements, and going into a northwest direction. 4.05 a.m. Ypsilanti, Police stated that the object was seen at the location of US-12 and I-04. 4.10 a.m., Monroe County called and said they also saw the objects. At 4.20 a.m., Bushrow and Foster saw four more in the same location, moving at a high rate of speed. 4.54 a.m., two more were spotted coming from the southeast over Monroe County. 5.04 5.04 a.m., Livingston County called and stated that they also saw the objects. 5.30 a.m., the report states Deputy Patterson and I, Corporal Broderick, looked out of the office and saw a bright light that appeared to be over the Ypsilanti area. It looked like a star, but was moving north to east. Bushrow added this note when he returned from patrol. This is the strangest thing that Deputy Foster and myself have ever witnessed. We would not have believed this story if we hadn't seen it for our own eyes. These objects could move at fantastic speeds and make very sharp turns, dive, and climb, and hover with great maneuverability. We have no idea of what these objects were, or where they could have come from. At 4.20 a.m., there were four of these objects flying in a line formation in a northwesterly direction. At 5.30 a.m., these objects went out of view and were not seen again. That same morning, Dexter, Michigan patrolman Robert Hunnewill was on patrol with patrolman Richard Alexa and two county deputies. He said, We first saw them in the early morning, maybe about 4 a.m. We saw red and white lights off in the distance, about four of them. On Thursday morning, March 17th, Washtenaw County deputies David Fitzpatrick and Noel Schneider had been called out on a minor accident. The following is Fitzpatrick's account. We seen three different objects in the sky to the south of us. Two of these objects were close together and the other farther to the east. On one of these objects we could see on one side white light and on the other a green light. We headed south towards Milan on Marion Road. At this time, we stopped the patrol car and looked back to the west and at the same time looked to the east and seen a real bright object hovering over what looked like US-23. 
We then drove to Arcona and Carpenter Roads, and Deputy Hennis let us use his field glasses. At this time, we seen this strange object and some colors. The top of it was yellowish blue-green, and the bottom bright red with what looked like a black marks across it. The object itself looked like a toy top when, at the above location, we were about five to ten miles from this object. This seems very unbelievable and something right out of these science fiction movies on TV. But Sergeant Newell Schneider of the Sheriff's Office remembered it well enough to draw it. No, it uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or rather any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. Remember Patrolman Robert Honowill that I mentioned just, just a bit ago? Well, he went on to report eight other sightings and took photographs several times. Honowill stated, Again on the 20th, my wife and I saw four objects hovering over the manor farm while the deputies were searching the swamp. Later that night, we'd just come home and were pulling into the driveway when one of the objects came over the house at no more than 3,000 feet took a couple of minutes to pass over. A couple of deputies followed it out of town and saw it hover over Island Lake Road in the direction of Manor Farm. And that is going to bring us to the main event. March 20th, 1966, Frank Manor, veteran, father of 10 children, was home with his family around 8.30 p.m. at their farmhouse northwest of Dexter, Michigan. I'll let Frank Manor tell you some of what he saw. Well, uh, first beginning, uh, we were watching television, and we have six dogs here, and they started raising a fuss, in which they never do much. So we, I went outside and gave a yell at them. And as I turned around to come back on the porch, I looked to the north of me, and uh, there were looked like a fallen star. Uh, Radar. It was red and kind of coming down and on a 40, about a 45. And so then I watched it and I was going to see if it landed and then maybe go down and see what it was. And uh, when it got to the top of the trees, it stopped and a, a blue and a white light come on it. And uh, I looked at it and I thought I was seeing things. According to a local newspaper, the manners all ran out on the porch and saw the thing like a ball of fire come out of the west, then drop below a clump of trees, maybe half a mile behind the house. Frank Manor said, Me and Ronnie, his 19-year-old son, decided to come down for a look. My wife, Lena, kicked up an awful fuss, said we might get radioactive. I told her if they was anything radioactive, we'd get it just as bad in the house as down in the swamp. I asked my two son-in-laws to come, but their wives wouldn't let them. We come over the knoll, just this side of the swamp, and there it was, about eye level with us, no more than 500 yards away. It had a blue light in front and in the back, a light that kept changing from red to white, like it was rotating, like the light on a police car. It was almost flat on the bottom, and kind of high and peaked on the top. We couldn't see much except the outline and the lights at the end, because the whole thing was wrapped in a light, like a halo and it kept shimmering. In another interview, Frank said, We got to about 500 yards of the thing. It was sort of shaped like a pyramid with a blue-green light on the right-hand side and on the left, a white light. I didn't see no antenna or porthole. The body was like a yellowish coral rock and looked like it had holes in it, sort of like if you took a piece of cardboard box and split it open. You couldn't see it too good because it was surrounded with heat waves like you see in the desert. The white light turned to a blood red as we got close to it, and Ron said, Look at that horrible thing. The official police report states, Frank Manor and his son, Ronald, saw hovering over a swamp about 1,500 feet away a brown luminous car-sized object with a scaly or waffled surface. Cone-shaped on top, flat on the bottom, or football-shaped, and two bluish-green lights on right and left edges that turned bright red and helped illuminate the object in between. Lights blinked out and the object reappeared instantly across the swamp 1,500 feet away. 
the whole object lit up with a yellowish glow at one point and also rose up 500 feet, then descended again. After two to three minutes of viewing, when two flashlights appeared in the distance, the object seemed to respond by flying away at high speed directly over the witnesses with a whistling sound like a rifle bullet ricocheting. Object remained in the swamp area for half an hour. But that wasn't the end of the sightings. On March 21, 1966, the day after Dexter's famous sightings, Mrs. Mary Leonard and her three children returned home from buying groceries. Their house was just southwest of Ann Arbor. She said, There was just one light. It glowed off and on, and it zigzagged a little. It was greenish and reddish, and it looked like it had a little light on it. We saw it in the southwest about 8.30 p.m., more than halfway up from the horizon. That same night, girls at McIntyre residence at Hillsdale College witnessed flashing lights hovering over a 14-acre Slayton Arboretum. Around 10.30 p.m., they saw a radiating, intense, silver-white light heading directly for the dorm. A brief flash of lightning illuminated the object for a second, and in that second, one of the girls saw what appeared to be a squashed football or basketball. The object nervously darted east away from the dorm, stopped in midair again, and moved in a jerky lateral way, first to the north, then south, then up and down. Well, when I was looking out the window with the binoculars, I guess it was about 12, I saw it, and I saw two red lights, and I saw what looked to be shaped like a pie. I could just see the front of it, and I just saw the round front, and I could see the lights on either side. And then the red light was sort of casting a glow over the whole thing, so it looked like a round disc. At first, when I'd heard the other girls talk about it, I didn't really... I believed them, yet I couldn't really make myself comprehend it because I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. But then when I saw it, I just was fascinated. I wasn't afraid. I, I just wanted to stay there and keep my eyes glued to it. I couldn't leave. I know I saw it. But, and I, I mean, I know myself I saw it, but I don't... I believe I saw it, but I can't fathom it because it seems so unreal. The commotion got the attention of the dorm mother, Kelly Hearn, and she called William Bud Van Horn the Hillsdale County Civil Defense Director. Thinking it was headlights or something explainable, he advised them to observe it and let him know if it didn't go away. When it didn't, he summoned a city police car and two state police units to investigate. The police said that the object caused exoteric interference with their radios. Van Horn arrived at the college and he and 87 students watched the eerie hovering object settle in a hollow near the school dorm. Word spread quickly and about 150 people observed the phenomenon. Van Horn watched the object through binoculars for three hours. It emitted orange, red, and white lights and appeared to hover a thousand to fifteen hundred yards from the dorm. Van Horn said it did not seem to be sitting on the ground. Ham radio operators reported several UFO sightings in the area for 10 days. The shape was round or oblong and the lights were changing because the object was rotating. The students said the object glowed red, white, and blue, and other colors. It rose up and down, vertical and horizontal, too fast to be a plane. The next day, Bud Van Horn went to check the area with his Geiger counter, to determine if there was any radioactive reading. There was no radioactivity detected. He was asked why he didn't go up to it. I'd uh, much rather be a live coward than a dead hero. And uh, with the area of uncertainty that we have here, uh, how do I know but what uh, maybe uh, maybe there's a current, uh, an electrical charge which is being uh, radiated by one of these vehicles which would... uh, Uh, electrocute you if you got within a certain area of it. There was no sound whatsoever. I could not hear a a bit of sound. Bud Van Horn had been the civil defense director for 10 years. A civil defense director is the person who is primarily responsible to coordinate and lead in developing civil defense and disaster preparedness. 
So it goes without saying that Bud Van Horn was someone who should know when something weird is going on. People who had witnessed the strange lights contacted police, and the reports were being taken seriously, most likely because law enforcement officers were also among the witnesses. Washtenaw County Sheriff at the time, Douglas Harvey, knew the manners and found them absolutely credible. He also believed his officers, so he requested help from federal investigators to figure out what the heck was going on, but the requests were ignored. So he then reached out to the congressional representative, Vivian J. Weston, who took him seriously. Weston pulled strings to get the Air Force to send an investigator. They sent an astrophysicist from Northwestern University, J. Allen Hynek. I've mentioned Hynek before in our Allagash abduction series, which were episodes 77 and 78. I mentioned him because he is the one who came up with the classification system of close encounter of the first, second, third, fourth kind. Hynek's UFO career started with the Air Force's Project Sign in 1948. He stayed on when Project Sign became Project Grudge, though he wasn't as involved in Project Grudge. When Project Grudge became Project Blue Book, he stayed on again. In his 1977 book, J. Allen Hynek said he was the debunker and that the Air Force expected him to debunk UFO reports. Though he was a skeptic in the beginning, Hynek's opinion changed and he began to openly disagree with the Air Force on cases. Once Blue Book ended, he became even more openly vocal. When Hynek arrived in Washtenaw County on March 23rd, the sheriff took him to the manor farm. Together they observed an area where the grass was matted down in a long, big circle. It looked like something had landed there, which is exactly what was reported. The sheriff asked Hynek what he thought was going on, and Hynek replied, You know, I don't really know. I really don't know. Something was there. As soon as Sheriff and J. Allen Hynek returned to the sheriff's office, Hynek received a call from Washington. The sheriff said, He went into my office. Twenty minutes later, he comes out of my office and he says, We have definitely discovered that it was swamp gas. Hynek went from, I don't know what it was, to, it was swamp gas, in a matter of minutes. On March 25, 1966, Hynek had a press conference, and he says the incident at the Manor Farm and the incident at Hillsdale College were both explained as swamp gas. He said that due to rotting vegetation in low-lying swamp areas, gases trapped by ice were released by the spring thaw and ignited, and those swamp gas lights were what people were seeing. He discounted the photo the, off the police officer took as the crescent moon and Venus. The sheriff, Douglas Harvey, did not go along with Hynek's explanation. He believed his officers. Hynek allegedly told the sheriff he was instructed to use the swamp gas theory. There were several reactions from various witnesses of the events. The sheriff said, that's a pretty weak theory. I'm not ready to accept it. Frank Manor said, I spent time on army maneuvers in the swamps of Louisiana during World War II. I've seen plenty of swamp gas. This wasn't it. We saw what we saw. Patrolman Hunnewill said, It's not marsh grass. My reaction to Dr. Hynix is the same as the rest of the people around here. He made us look like fools. I don't think he'll get any cooperation out of these people anymore. Lena Manor, Frank's wife, said, I'm no professor, and I'm not as educated as him, but I think he's all wrong. Hynek also mentioned that he thought the case at Hillsdale College might have involved flares. This angered Bud Van Horn, who said no flares were involved. He stated, I didn't care for the methods of investigation. I know no flares were involved. Hynek did stress the swamp gas theory only explained the Dexter and Hillsdale College sightings. The sightings made prior by deputies were still unexplained. I did a little digging on swamp gas because I personally have never seen it, and so I wasn't sure if it could actually explain away so many different UFO sightings. Because after this, 
swamp gas was the Air Force go-to explanation, of course until weather balloons. Swamp gas is defined as a bluish flame that flies a few feet off the ground, burns pale blue, sometimes yellow. One question scientists studying swamp gas have is how exactly it ignites itself. It's all well and good to say there's gas, but unless someone is there lighting it off, and yes, there are YouTube videos of people in a swamp lighting off swamp gas, how does it catch fire? One theory was that there was a presence of phosphine, and the gas has to be contaminated with phosphorus tetrahydride. When they conducted lab experiments, the flame was bright green and smelled really bad. Overall, the experiment yielded a lot of gas that really didn't ignite itself. This information was the University of Maryland Baltimore County website. Nowhere did I see any photo or video evidence that showed ignited swamp gas performing in various maneuvers or changing colors. I'd have to say, I think swamp gas is a bogus theory. On March 29, 1966, Lawrence Espy, Ph.D., wrote that he witnessed a bright crimson light near Ann Arbor's VA hospital. The strange-looking object made maneuvers uncharacteristic of aircraft and was, was observed by another independent witness whose report was in the Ann Arbor News. In his letter, Espy does not say he saw a UFO, but he does have an issue with the idea of swamp gas as an explanation. His challenges to the swamp gas theory include why does it appear to glow rather than flame? Methane burns with a colorless flame. What determines the color of the ignited gas being observed? Since gas normally has neither independent shape nor volume, but tends to expand indefinitely, what are the unnatural properties of swamp gas which allow it to remain as a dense, uniform sphere at altitudes over a thousand feet? What propels the gas during the rapid, unpredictable maneuvers commonly described by viewers? Why do the spheres of ignited gas sometimes terminate in a high-velocity dive to the ground? It seems like a burning gas would rise. Because of the numerous sightings in Michigan and the less-than-satisfactory explanation of swamp gas, House Minority Leader and Michigan Representative Gerald Ford requested an investigation into the matter. I wanted to read this letter written by Gerald Ford to Representative George P. Miller, Chairman of Science and Astronautics Committee, U.S. House of Representatives, Washington, D.C., and Representative L. Mendel Rivers, the Chairman of Armed Services Committee, U.S. House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Dear Chairman Miller and Rivers, No doubt you have noted the recent flurry of newspaper stories about unidentified flying objects, UFOs. I have taken special interest in these accounts because many of the latest reported sightings have been in my home state of Michigan. The Air Force sent a consultant, astrophysicist Dr. J. Allen Hynek of Northwestern University, to Michigan to investigate the various reports, and he dismissed all of them as the product of college student pranks or swamp gas, or an impression created by the rising crescent moon and the planet Venus. I do not agree that all of these reports can be, or should be, so easily explained away. Because I think there may be substance to some of these reports, and because I believe the American people are entitled to a more thorough explanation than has been given them by the Air Force to date, I am proposing that either the Science and Astronautics Committee or the Armed Services Committee of the House schedule hearings on the subject of UFOs and invite testimony from both the executive branch of the government and some of the persons who claim to have seen UFOs. I enclose material which I think will be helpful to you in assessing the advisability of an investigation of UFOs. May I first call to your attention a column by Roscoe Drummond, published last Sunday, in which Mr. Drummond says, Maybe all of these reported sightings are whimsical, imaginary, or unreal, but we need a more credible and detached appraisal of the evidence than we are getting. Mr. Drummond goes on to state, 
we need to get all the data drawn together to one place and examined far more objectively than anyone has done so far. A stable public opinion will come from a trustworthy look at the evidence, not from belittling it. The time has come for the President or Congress to name an objective and respected panel to investigate, appraise, and report on all the present and future evidence about what is going on. I agree fully with Mr. Drummond's statements. I also suggest you scan and the enclosed series of six articles by Bulkley Griffin of the Griffin Larrabee News Bureau here. In the last of his articles, published last January, Mr. Griffin says, A main conclusion can be briefly stated. It is that the Air Force is misleading the public by its continuing campaign to produce and maintain belief that all sightings can be explained away as misidentification of familiar objects, such as balloons, stars, and aircraft. I have just today received a number of telegrams urging a congressional investigation of UFOs. One is from retired Air Force Colonel Harold R. Brown, Ardmore, Tennessee, who says, I have seen UFO, will be available to testify. Another from Mrs. Ethel M. Davis, Eugene, Oregon, reads, Nine out of ten people want truth of UFOs. Press your investigation to the fullest. Ronald Collier of Los Angeles, who identifies himself as a scientist from MIT, urges that you do everything in your power to make Air Force Project Blue Book, the Air Force name for its study and verdicts on UFO reports, known to the public. Are we to assume that everyone who says he has seen UFOs is an unreliable witness? A UPI story out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, dated March 21, 1966, states that at least 40 persons, including 12 policemen, said today that they saw a string of flying objects guarded by four sister ships land in a swamp near here Sunday night. Matt Sorrell of Station WJR Detroit cites an eyewitness account of a recent UFO sighting by Emil Greenier of Ann Arbor, an aeronautical engineer employed by Ford Motor Company. He points out that an aeronautical engineer can hardly be considered an untrustworthy witness. In the firm belief that the American public deserves a better explanation than that thus far given by the Air Force, I strongly recommend that there be a committee investigation of the UFO phenomena. I think we owe it to the people to establish credibility regarding UFOs and to produce the greatest possible enlightenment on the subject. Kindest personal regards, sincerely, Gerald R. Ford. This was followed by a news release, and I am going to share that as well. This was April 3rd, 1966. Statement by House Minority Leader Gerald R. Ford, Republican, Michigan. As I have expected, some persons have ridiculed my call for a congressional investigation of unidentified flying objects, UFOs. These people are a fraction of those who have given me their reaction to my proposal. The overwhelming majority of those expressing a view in letters to me, believe a congressional investigation would be useful and is needed. Those who scoff at the idea of a congressional investigation of UFOs apparently are unaware that the House Armed Services Committee has scheduled a closed-door hearing on the matter Tuesday with the Air Force and that Representative Joseph E. Carth, Democrat of Minnesota, headed a three-man subcommittee which held two days of hush-hush hearings five years ago on behalf of the House Science and Astronautics Committee. Carth has confirmed in conversation with a member of my staff that he conducted these secret hearings. The present Science and Astronautics Committee Chairman, Representative George F. Miller, Democrat, California, has shied away from a UFO probe at this time, saying his committee does not have jurisdiction over the Air Force. But the late Representative o Overton Brooks, Democrat Louisiana, obviously had different ideas because he tapped Carth to summon Air Force witnesses 
and questioned them after a flurry of UFO sightings in 1961. Karth has informed me that his subcommittee made an oral report to the full com- committee but never released anything to the public. According to Charles F. Dukander, the committee staff director, no record was made of conversation between Karth, subcommittee members, and Air Force witnesses. The hearings, he said, took place in Karth's congressional office. I have never said that I believe any of the reported UFO sightings indicates visits to Earth from another planet. Apart from pranks and natural phenomena, some of these objects may well be products of experimentation by our own military. If this is so, why doesn't the Air Force concede it and in this way reassure the American people? There would be no need to go into detail on the nature of the experiments. Mr. Ford, uh, what about flying saucers? You've had some in Michigan in the past uh, week. Do you really believe in flying saucers? You've called for a congressional investigation. Dave, uh, we've had several uh, incidents in Michigan in the last uh, week. Uh, incidents that uh, many reliable, good citizens felt were uh, sufficient to justify some action by our government and not the kind of flippant answer that was given by the Air Force uh, where they passed it off as a, a swamp gas. The Congress should investigate the rash of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects in southern Michigan and other parts of the country. The U.S. Air Force convened a committee of 11 scientists headed by Edward Condon, a physicist. After two years, they concluded nothing went on and there was nothing of scientific value. Project Blue Book ended the same year these findings were released. And that's going to do it for this episode. Remember, you can find Lurk where you listen to your favorite podcasts and at lurkpodcast.com where you'll find all your episodes, where you'll find all our episodes along with links to our social media accounts. Don't forget that our Patreon will be launching soon, uh, should be launched in April. Also, mark your calendars because we have a third festival that we'll be attending. On June 24th, there is a festival in Sykesville, Maryland that will be celebrating the Sykesville Monster, which was one of our episodes, and Lurk will be there. So if you're in the area, and I know we have a lot of listeners who aren't too far away from from that area come on out stop by say hi buy a t-shirt and then in august on august 26 we have the bigfoot and paranormal expo in reynolds reynoldsville pennsylvania and then there's the whitehall new york sasquatch festival on september 30th we will be vending at all of these events so stop by our booth say hi grab some merch hang out it'll be lots of fun And until next time, keep lurking.